job of our public libraries interview series where we talk to professionals who perform interesting work. My name is Sam Martello and with me this week is Matthew and Andrea Lawrence. So, hello! Hello! <laughs> Welcome to the show! Very pleased to be here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to tell the audience a little bit about both of you before we get started. So, Matthew graduated with honors in marketing and advertising from Georgian College. He is also a has a technical certificate in radio and television broadcasting from the National Institute of Broadcasting. He has a, been a professional actor for 20 years and has entertained audiences all over the world with his troupe, the Canadian Improv Showcase. He is married to a school teacher and has discovered an untapped joy of working in education. <laughs> and Andrea is an exceptional teacher and published author. She's a Bachelor's of Arts in English Literature from New York University and a Master's of Education from the University of Tirana. Uh, she spent 31 years in the classroom and is now thrilled to help bring to life on a day-to-day -day basis crazy fun awesome programs. Sure. Yay! Yay! Yeah! <laughs> That's what we do in a nutshell. Yeah. In a nutshell. Yeah. So the the, the uh, parent company is OEI Onset Education, which is a registered educational charity. And under that umbrella, we can create whatever programs we want. And we currently have two. We have Canadian Improv Showcase, which is a professional touring comedy improv troupe. It's been around since 1997. Uh, it's kind of like Whose Lies It Anyway, but with 100% Canadian cast. We wear custom-made hockey jerseys and things like that and, and go around the world doing a wide variety of things and even virtual stuff now, as mm -hmm. well as uh, workshops and stuff. And some of our interesting uh, feathers and our caps with the improv troupe have been things like uh, Best of Fest at a variety of uh, fringe festivals, uh, of being the only outside company to go into the Kingston Penitentiary and actually um, work with their inmates. Um, with a program we called the Healing Power of Laughter, and we got in and out on all three occasions, <laughs> uh, which is important to, to note. Uh, and we had actually had um, residents there or inmates who actually put on their rehabilitation forms when they were going for towards uh, probation that our work with them actually made them, you know, want to live and get back out into society. So that was a big oh. feather in the cap of the improv troupe, uh, as well as representing Canada on the international stage on a, a number of uh, times, including going to Singapore in 2004. And uh, we're still going strong now. We do a, a monthly uh, virtual performance uh, every single month, and our next one's coming up in June. It'll be a schools out theme. We like having themes of those kind of things. <laughs> and our other program is Nights in the Classroom, and that's Nights with a K, uh, where we bring history uh, to life uh, by doing hands-on things so uh we've got um roman shield shields for roman shield formations we put them in the hands of our participants because uh, both programs are educational based and we work with a variety of groups uh the knights in the classroom works with uh, school kids we work with uh community groups we work with camps we work with seniors facilities uh and we bring all of the same sort of content customized to each group uh, and we'll do things like ancient sports and ancient mm. games like viking chess uh the roman shield formation formations i mentioned where we bring a class set of shields to a school where all the kids get a shield. We teach them the same formations the Romans created during the height of the Roman period uh, and the same formations the riot police use today in case a peaceful protest is no longer peaceful. Uh, and then we let the teachers test the formations by throwing dodgeballs at them, which for some reason seems rather Everybody popular. Everybody has such a good time! I don't know why. And they learn a lot about history. Mm -hmm. What else do we do? Also, can I have a shield? I want one of those. Yeah, they're fun. Uh -huh. they're a lot of, we built a whole bunch yeah. of shields, as a matter of fact. Our, our whole house is covered yeah. in equipment, so yeah, we built we a do, number of shields, too. Yeah, we do puppetry workshops. Mm -hmm. We do drumming around the world. We do watercolor workshops where we show people how to create their own landscape. Mm -hmm. your, your program, yeah. That Was Then, This Is Now, is very popular about daily life and comparing things to a lot of the kids today don't have a concept beyond electricity. Like, they're just, yeah. they can't kind of get the idea, and we sort of break that down for them, even virtually now too we've taken yeah. that program virtually we have one called the armory we do archery with them uh, fencing as well as we're sponsored by the ontario fencing association yes. we bring that live to them that one's tough to do virtually yeah, if, if you are do a, that now <laughs> if you are a fencer i know a lot of the guys you've interviewed before yeah. um have done they'll do classes on zoom and if you are an established fencer that's good but if you're just learning it's not quite yeah. the same thing so plus you that's need something in the way of equipment yeah, so that's... normally we would bring that to you mm -hmm. and then you could try it try it on and put everything on and then we would teach you about it and most of our live presentations end with us in full equipment 
full armor uh, and doing a historical martial arts demonstration. Yeah. We actually have a, a manual written in 1399 by an Italian gentleman by the name of Fiore Daly Berry, who wrote down the proper way for a knight to do battle that about mm -hmm. five to 10% of the knights themselves had access to. We train with that. We train an awful lot. We do. Uh, and then we demonstrate um, long sword and sword and shield and polax and spear all in front of the students. <laughs> the weapons aren't sharp, but they get a chance yeah. to see that as well as hand to hand combat and a little bit of dagger here and there, depending on on how that goes. And we'll go wherever we have access. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. And I am already jealous that I didn't have this as a child. I'm not going to lie. It is pretty cool. The kids always have a lot of fun. Um, it works really well, too, with the, with the ASD being such a, a big proponent now in education. Mm -hmm. These kids get hands on like we don't have kids in fencing uh, worried about, you know, uh, losing their attention span like that. When they're fencing, mm -hmm. they have the equipment on, they take to it. And we've had kids uh, of we've even had kids that um, have had some some physical uh, developmental issues that yeah. they have done really well with fencing. We had we had a child who actually had a special walker that he used and he wanted to fence and we got him outfitted and yeah. we had a support worker with him and he was there and he got his foil up in there and he did it and it was cameras everywhere and tears everywhere and this kid was triumphant and it yeah. was just amazing to see. That's like kind of the reason we do this. Deb. And actually one of the things that I fre frequently share with kids and seniors is that it's never too late to try something if you think you want to give it a go yeah. like um i was in my late 50s when i started fencing and i fenced because i wanted to heal a wrist in injury and it actually helped increase my range of motion and it just made me stronger and i just can't believe that you know i was able to start something so late and it's just something i love and i've met the most amazing people yeah. They're always so kind and wonderful and they want to help me with things. And it's just, it's just great. Yeah, fencing is, is one of those rare sports that's a um, an anti-aging sport for your brain as well. So when we do work at, at seniors facilities and whatnot, we bring equipment in case they want to try yeah. and we encourage them because we the last tournament we did before COVID was our, our actual club, the New Market Club's tournament itself. And there was a gentleman in his 80s on there and I watched him hand several butts to ha several younger <laughs> individuals as a matter of fact, because it, it's possible in fencing, it really is. No, that's not yeah. Cool. So I'm going to ask, why did you guys create Nights in the Classroom to begin with? Well, that was technically your idea. Well, yeah, it kind of was. I mean, you had this great passion for the long sword and, and armor and, and trying to get armor and get into armor. And, and, and I've always been very passionate in my, my classroom about bringing experiences to kids that would make them kind of live it. You know, I'm... <laughs> When I taught grades seven and eight history, I would have students who come back midway through high school and they'd say, you know, I still remember the causes of the war of 1812 because you made us do a skit. We had to do this dramatic thing and we had to have people act, act it out. And it just comes alive when you've got to be a character and you got to consider what is it I'm worried about? What do I got to do? As opposed to just being a, a history book where you're going, yeah. Right. And and so I said, I said to Matt, I said, we have to do something about bringing this to classrooms. I only have one classroom where I can do this crazy fun stuff, but I think it needs to be bigger than that. And so that's how that kind of happened. And, and then you started going to places and I kept saying, I must retire so that I could come with you because he would come home with these great stories. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to be there too. Well, actually before that too, with the improv troupe, I mean, I was an active actor and I created the improv troupe because when you're an active actor, you have long times between, I mean, I don't look like Ryan Reynolds. So, you know, <laughs> if I look more like Ryan Reynolds, maybe I got more gigs and I wouldn't be here right now. But you know, <laughs> when you don't have those kind of looks and whatnot, you don't get the same opportunities necessarily. So the improv troupe was created because I loved whose line and because I wanted some way of of continually practicing and improving as an actor. And then you came up with the concepts, so, you know, you could go to schools with this and do workshops and that actually pays money. And that's always yeah. handy too when you're an actor because they always want you to work for free, yeah. which is a whole other thing. Well, similarly, I was doing um, improv in my own classroom and then we would do wonderful things like put on Shakespeare plays or Charles Dickens plays that I wrote and, you know, put into junior version because I taught grade five, six a lot. And other teachers would say, how do you do that? And I would tell them, you know, basically layers of do this, do this. And they would be like, no, I don't think so. And so I thought there's also a need there for someone to come in and, and help guide kids and, and, and teachers who were may, maybe new to that through that whole 
process and you took to that too yeah, so, so we, we did yeah. a couple about eight years solid eight years of workshops with just the improv troupe and then we also were always having these with my marketing background we'd have surveys every year of what other areas of the curriculum would be interesting to explore through you know his, through um you know hands-on presentations and they said do you do anything for grade four medieval studies because at then it wasn't even ancient civilizations like it is now because they pushed the grade four and five curriculum together and i'm like ooh excuses to buy swords that's pretty cool because we met doing community theater and a theater aurora as a matter of fact we met we on did. the stage there and doing pride and prejudice she sung the praises of the, of the new young bachelor in town who happened to be me and after three weeks she decided to keep me for herself so that was how we met uh and then and then from that we got a chance to do a variety of things and uh medieval studies when we got married we actually had a medieval ceremony and you know people dressed up and there was a sword and there was uh, there was an impromptu battle during our reception and whatnot and then the improv troupe was on stage that night as a matter of fact so any wow. chance to do that kind of thing we jumped at it i had started training uh with the academy of european medieval martial arts in downtown toronto where they do dagger and and sword and shield and and long sword and whatnot and i fell in love with the concept i'm like there's a lot of historical and educational elements to this where you can bring the curriculum to life so we started doing that our first presentation happened to be at sharon public school as a matter of fact boys had ever changed a lot since yeah, then we've and, grown a lot <laughs> and then since then we started adding other people other actors other mm -hmm. specialists we got some retired teachers mm -hmm. uh and then just things continue to snowball and the curriculum changes uh and we added things to it and and we just want to make it as awesome as possible i mean i never would have thought you know 15 years ago we build a catapult and spend 200 hours building a catapult <laughs> historically accurately and i went to we got, i got four family members that are engineers so if they're watching this right now you guys were not very helpful uh not at all just because you're an engineer does not mean you know everything just saying and so i went to these guys and they didn't they're like no no we just we talk about that in school we never actually did anything i'm like what the heck uh so if you see a book and you see an image of a catapult that's got a spoon on the end it's historically inaccurate no matter what they tell you even even a published book it has to be a slick that's the most historically accurate. They would have used a sling because nothing will hold it in place. So you see movies and that you call shenanigans. Uh -huh. Anytime you see a spoon on the end <laughs> of a catapult or an onagers, which ours is called. So uh -huh. I actually went to someone with a military background. I'm not allowed to give you his name because you know, you know, you know, and he's you know high you level, know, you know, because you, you know, know. <laughs> top top secret. Yeah, and he helped us come up with the designs, and it went through six different machinations, yeah. and we now have one we can take to schools. It is full size for the type that it is. It's called an onager, and the kids get a chance to build structures, and then we knock it down and we have programs for libraries too to do that yes. when things open up again yeah. so it's it's pretty wild to get a chance to do that kind of stuff no that is fabulous and we totally can't wait to have you at a world public library at some point because i want to see this catapult yeah it's a shield and uh -huh. i want to see that giant tile that's in the background going yes i want to do all the things yes me pick me please yeah so yeah. i'm gonna ask a different question so what where do you get your equipment from and if you have to make them did you have to learn any historical skills to make them accurate? So the catapult was a, is a great story that kind of amplifies this, but I'm just curious about like how much equipment like you have to get to do some of your shows. Well, the armor itself, uh, when I first started this 10 years ago with the, with the Knights in the Classroom part, um, I would just buy equipment. And, and for most cases, we can buy stuff. There are some great places overseas where you can get things that are not, you know, bazillions of dollars. And there are some blacksmiths here. And uh, wherever we can, we'd like to take the experience to make stuff. But our major equipment is purchased. Uh, my full kit that gives me my full Tin Man look uh, is actually made overseas for me. And it was custom made. They had to give me measurements of all over my entire body and including across my forehead, my nose and my chin because when you do order stuff online from these variety of websites you get certain measurements and certain expectations but then when you go to put it on and you got a predominant nose like I do then it doesn't go past my beak and then it just sits on the shelf oh look how pretty that is and I can try and resell it later on so it's not like you can go to Canadian Tire but I mean we have got a chance to do an amaz amazing uh, blacksmithing experience uh, in East Columbia there's mm -hmm. actually an active blacksmith uh, his name's John Walker and his forge is called Fallen Willow Forge we went and did his level one workshop a couple of months ago and we got a chance to make our own knives which is really really cool we both did it we and get to do a show go show ahead and do tell. a show and tell we yeah. took a railroad oh, spike and made that into an actual knife itself so we hold yeah. it from here you can see where the what it started got off it. like yeah. here and we had to thin it out and we had to bring it all down and he doesn't have us using any electrical things like you see on forged and fire we had to do it all by hand and i'm extremely proud of andrea because she did everything that the three men who were in there doing she did the exact same thing she had no extra help she had to have all the pipes the big muscles to do that and she did and she <laughs> yeah. did 16 hours in the forge along with the rest of us yeah and we get these custom made knives at the end and uh yeah. if you're interested in that fallen willow forge is not hard to find i believe they're on on facebook as well as maybe a website i'm sure they're on facebook and uh 
uh, it was a pretty amazing experience. And a year, gorgeous knife, by the way. And a year before that, we had done a leather making workshop, so we custom made our own um, sheath, our own sheath to be able to put that that in. Yeah, leatherworking is a lot of fun. Yeah. If you're interested in taking up history, leatherworking is the foundation of a lot of aspects of things. And uh, it's a really easy thing this to take up. Mats. And there's a lot of supplies <laughs> around. You can get things even delivered these days because you know, we have to have everything delivered right now. But um, I'd love to do more of that. We're going to do a level two. Uh, Andrea's picked her, her level two um, project, which is going to be making a Hori Hori, which is a type of a Japanese gardening tool that dates back to ancient times. And I'm going to make myself a throwing axe so she can dig the garden and then i'll say i'll deal with our and you know the weeds the weeds yeah, yes, i'll take the weeds <laughs> i'll deal with the weeds with my throwing axe yeah got this <laughs> yeah absolutely so i guess my next question is how difficult is it to gain uh funding for nights in the classroom well we got the charitable fund the charitable um uh, designation which was uh, two years of a lot of stress a lot of work because there's been, there's been enough people out there doing things illegally that they really have to make sure everything's done properly and so it was literally our our mission statement had to be analyzed word for word and i worked with the government very well they were great actually uh to get that that handled and now that gives us the benefit of being able to receive funding because currently our virtual programs are free even though our, our full school year is absolutely booked um we were able to get funding to bring that to schools so that's the only thing that has made it difficult for us is schools and community groups and seniors facilities they have limited funding so by having the charitable background if we can find a a, a person who wants to give some money and our programs are not dramatically expensive we've, we've kept them as low as we possibly can uh, even though we do have specialists, um, they can a person or a business or we can continue to apply for grants and anyone who's generous enough to donate the funds will actually get a, a legitimate charitable tax receipt. Uh, but it is a challenge. I do spend an awful lot of time when we're not in four or five hours of virtual workshops a day um, looking for funding and, uh, and talking to foundations and and jumping through all the very technical hoops to get things applied because literally if you get one thing wrong on your application it's disqualified so it is a, a great challenge i'm i'm always in search of our golden goose if you will <laughs> uh for each program because you know what we do has merit i mean our websites speak for themselves and our the fact we've been doing this for as long as we have uh has a great deal of merit and kids love what we do and and the improv does an awful lot of good people need to laugh so it is incredibly challenging and it's probably the hardest part of this uh, but once that's established it's what we do is so much fun. It just it just makes it all worthwhile by the end. No, that's wonderful. And I do hope that you guys continue to get continuous funding. It looks like this year you did sort of have a golden goose. And we did. Yeah, we did find one. The St. John's uh, United uh, Church Foundation of Alliston. Uh, they were fantastic. They gave us a lovely grant that's brought us to we we did 77 hours of virtual workshops in May alone. And we've got a few more. We've got a few more weeks of school left. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's been really cool to be able to do all that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that actually kind of segues into my next question, which is how challenging has it been to do nights in the classroom virtually given COVID? Well, you might as well tell this story because you were doubtful at first. At first, I was, no, we can't do this. <laughs> we're a hands on experiential thing. You can't touch this artifact that I have for you. This is never going to work. Mm -hmm. And then we just slowly started to put it together and um, just got a lot, a lot of feedback from people that were really helpful and insightful and so we just we just went for it and, and we found yeah. experiential things we could do so we can we have our that was then this yeah. is now which is the daily life aspect we tell kids what it's like in the, when they're in their their rooms and stuff we say to them well that room is probably the size of an entire peasant home throughout most of ancient history and then we tell them what it's made out of and we yeah. add enough gross stuff in there to make it memorable and we've got a bucket next to us we show them which is this there's is what you your bathroom you, there's your bathroom that's always yeah. interesting and we show them what pre toilet paper was and we won't spoil that one uh, <laughs> and then we can show them different swords and and puppetry works really well in this environment as a matter of fact i got my little guy here who loves to come up and hello i'm <laughs> king what's his face and you know with, the, with, with that you can get up real close to the to the mark hello what are you strange people yeah. doing in here why are you watching me and all these other things oh, you can do you camera hog king yeah, no, i know he's gonna, he's gonna get proper in front. and, and puppetry went extremely well we've got art of the court jester where the kids get a chance to learn what it was like to be a jester yeah. which is actually a lot older than the medieval period uh we've got an amazing uh a drumming instructor lady mm -hmm. tamara who's got her son who's a professional musician who yeah. doesn't have a lot going on right now so he's yeah. donated his time to us and we can do drumming they have to keep their their microphones off because you know that's the challenge with the, the limitation of the virtual is that all the microphones fight for dominance uh but they can be on screen and drum 
learning and learn all the different aspects and, and watercolor really blew my mind yeah. because I mean, as as a teacher for 31 years, I had always, you know, I'd been in the classroom with students and their paper and their paints and and helping. And the first one felt mm. so strange <laughs> that I had to be on this end. And OK, here, let me show you where we're going to work on the background first. And all right, I'll give you a couple of minutes. And I would tell them little things about the history of painting and why hum humans paint. And and then and then they'd show me thing things on the screen. I'm like, oh, wow, that's amazing. But I didn't have anything to clean up. It felt very weird because <laughs> usually I'm helping and I'm like, hey, there's there's a perk. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then we got the armory as well. Where we get we go through a bit of a slideshow with uh, through showing a timeline of ancient history, and we'll bring out some different swords and things like that. And we do utilize our YouTube channel an awful lot too, which is mm. nice because uh, we've it, when we when the pandemic first hit, we didn't know what to do for a good six months because the teachers and schools were all figuring it out and they had zero funding. It's part of the reason why we worked so hard to get the grant because they still don't have funding. I mean, they're they're using funding for their for their for their athletics on PPE because they didn't they weren't given enough funding. And so with with that, we started doing videos we'd meant to do for five or ten years so yeah. we got some really exploratory sort of, you know. things with archery where we get a chance to shoot at different different types of armor that we couldn't do in a school and yeah. and if you watch our videos you'll see why yeah. a couple of times a few arrows came back at me uh which makes for the world's yeah. most amazing 3d movie and i survived to tell the tale and actually we're hoping in the next couple of weeks to do n number four and number five in our yeah. archery series and even the one about the catapult like there's no way that we could have been able to demonstrate to people you know, all the different stages we, we went through and how it took four hours to string it. And but we were able to yeah. compile a video of footage that we had over, over that time of experiment, fail, plan, try again, fail, try again. And, and so that was all there then. Yeah. So it's been really handy to be able yeah. to try and use all these different tools together to bring things to life in a, in a similar fashion that we would on what in person. No, that's fantastic. And you know what, it's been a great challenge, I think, for anyone that's in education or even for what we do at the library. It's a lot of trial and error, and it's definitely a lot of throwing darts at the board and hoping just one yeah. thing sticks, right? Yeah. It's, it's a shotgun method, right? You got yeah. to shoot, shoot a big spray of things and hopefully Hope something's something going to hit. Got, yeah. And, you know, it's, I mean, we've seen a lot of the efforts the libraries have been going to, and it's been very impressive. We created a library program a few years we ago, did, and I got a chance yeah. to travel around a little bit to a few libraries yeah. here and there. But again, you guys are in the same boat as schools, right? It's only so much funding you guys have access to, so... Mm. Well, That's not, and not having to clean up, Andrea, I'm totally with you on that. It's been fun to make craft videos and being like, I don't have to clean up after me. This is fantastic. <laughs> we don't have to worry about anyone eating the stuff in the corner or anything else like that. It's yeah. all yeah. yeah. like, little Jimmy, please don't eat the paste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Leave some for me later. It's my dinner. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. So is there anything from medieval times that you guys practice regularly? I saw that, again, you showed the knives that you made, but... Is there anything in your day to day that kind of influences the work that you do? Oh, well, I'd say yoga, first of all. Yeah. Um, yoga is a daily thing for us just to be yeah. able to do what we do. I mean, when I'm putting on my full armor, it's 88 pounds of, of armor. Yeah. So that's kind of tough. My chiropractor loves me because I think I've paid for at least one cottage at this point now, <laughs> uh, at least one, because you know I'm slowly shrinking over a time period as my sp as my spine you know no, compresses. You're not, honey. Exactly. Yeah, What's going not... on? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so you know, uh, so yoga is a big part of that. It's, it's yeah. quite regular. We do we do fence a fair bit, and we yeah. do a lot of cross training. Badminton's yeah. fantastic for for and fencing's great for the historical fencing too. Because if, if we do an awful yeah. lot of historical fencing, it's much much slower. Because if I'm an 88 pounds, I mean I yeah. I can move as fast as I want to, but but oftentimes for the students, we will slow things down a small amount just so they can see the different movements. Because if the part of the reason they don't put accurate portrayal of swords and, and fencing in movies is it's too fast. They get used, your eye can't keep up unless you're you know, educated. So a lot of the times with that, we have to slow it down a bit. But if we do a lot of historical fencing, then my fencing gets really, really poor. <laughs> if we train fencing an awful lot, then I have to slow it down a bit when yeah. we're actually doing the historical because they relate to one another. But uh, it is it is neat to see the nuances and the differences. Yeah. And we, we try to train as much as we can. We've we, got some great sponsors. Yeah, so. we do a lot of hiking and, and cross training too, as you said, because we have to be really strong and in really good shape mm -hmm. to be able to carry that weight and not actually swing the swords <laughs> yeah and this does require a fair bit of a fair bit of training as far as that and we have to do archery an awful lot too just to be able to do the videos because it's not mm -hmm. like i can pick a bow up once a year and hit a bullseye or hit a moving target or mm -hmm. do distance things and we're trying to do one with a fire chamber arrow but i've got to get the fire chamber arrows made first so the fire department's really excited about doing that with us though for some <laughs> strange reason they seem bored enough to want to help us with that so that'll be a, a thing in the future for us to do looking down the road that's gonna be fantastic and i can't wait to see that 
so I guess that kind of leads into my next question, which is, are there television shows or movies that you feel best represent medieval times and what you guys do for your shows? Well, for the most part, I think there's probably two. Um, we watched Forged in Fire a lot because we enjoy that a lot. History yeah. Channel's somewhat hit and miss. Some of their yeah. stuff's a little sensationalized. Some of it's really good and, and that's some fine. of it's, no. With, yeah. with, with Forged in Fire, they do use modern equipment and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the, the concept, as we've been told, that the, the what they call Damascus today is not what used to be Damascus. And that's a very complicated um, discussion. But uh, Forged in Fire is good to see the, the forging aspects of things, especially when they make them use non-electric uh, tools. Uh, so we really enjoy that one. Uh, even from a daily life standpoint, and how people lived in ancient times since we do medieval and roman and greek yeah. and mesopotamian egypt and everything else uh the television show alone is yeah. actually quite good on the history channel as well for what people would have gone through obviously in the larger capacity other than alone yeah. being a game show where you're all by yourself but how people had to survive yeah. that's a really neat one too for the daily life aspects and what they would have done and how they wasted nothing i mean yeah. our, our first nations are amazing and we always stress to them in our, our workshops all the students that you know if it wasn't for the first nations we literally would not be here because right. without their kindness we wouldn't have survived wouldn't have that it. first winter and, yeah. and there is documented evidence of, of the vikings uh the scandinavians trying on three separate occasions long before columbus yeah. trying to colonize parts of, of of north america and they just they couldn't work with the first nations they couldn't figure out the language and they just couldn't survive the winter so yeah. it's it is um there's a lot of things out there I mean, you got to take everything with a grain of salt and do a bit of research so like the television show vikings was good for a while and then it kind of ran yeah, off the rails they, and yeah. same thing there's, there's a lot of historical programming so you know if it gets people interested Interested, we're cool, but yeah. uh, those are the two that we really do find yeah. the most effective right now. And we're, you know, we're happy to listen to the History Channel if they want to send us an email about uh, consulting with them a bit and with our <laughs> acting backgrounds. Actually, there's a couple of TV shows we've been a part of with uh, within the company itself, but uh, it's it's few and far between, unfortunately. But we're we're available if you can call our people. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> why is it important that we understand things that were done in the past, and why is it important for you guys to show this to students? Oh, principally, I'm hoping that if we learn from what happened in the past, we won't make the same mistakes. Yeah. It's one thing to make new mistakes mm. and then learn from them going forward. But if we're going to do the same old, same old, you really got to wonder how much are we really evolving? Yeah. How What is the growth mindset out, out there if we keep doing the same old if 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 we make the same poor choices over and over mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly it yeah absolutely so my very last question for you guys is if you could live in any time period when would it be and why mm. what's your answer well i'd like to say i don't mind vacationing <laughs> in the medieval period or the victorian period mm. which i really love too or anything between jane austen and charles dickens i'm good but I'm still very grateful. The more I learn about history, the more grateful I am to be living now. Mm. Even, even when you look at, at the history of pandemics, at least we get to see each other and we have health care. And, you know, there's all that technology that now makes communicating and still being part, part of a yeah. community possible, whereas before that was extremely hard and it had to be cripplingly isolating. Yeah. I'd say the same thing. I, I like the medieval period, especially. Um, I mean, I'd rather live in the medieval period than in yeah. the Victorian age and the Industrial Revolution with all that dirt and filth and all the all the soot in the air well, from all the chimneys and all the, all the factories and Clearly, I think I'm going to have a country estate somewhere right, exactly. and have afternoon tea every day. Clearly, that's my plan. But I also don't mind. I mean, the, the Viking Age over overlaps in the medieval period, yeah. so that kind of stuff is is, is uh, one of my favorite times. So I, I like that. It's it's a it's a simpler time in some ways, mm -hmm. and I think I like that a whole bunch too. It's just part of the reason why we you know don't live in the big city anymore. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything that you've discussed with us today. Like you guys do amazing stuff. And I really hope that, you know, with the school year winding down that you guys get a little bit of a rest. Mm -hmm. I hope that we can at some point have you at the library. I mean, I'm sure there's plotting. <laughs> and I just, I enjoyed this conversation. And again, I'm, I'm jealous that I didn't have this as a kid, if I'm being honest. <laughs> Yeah, we were too. We didn't have it either. And the, <laughs> the funniest thing for us is when I was studying uh, history in high school, I the the our former uh, MPP Julia Monroe was my actual grade ten history teacher, and she was my, my favorite teacher. Not to speak, speak ill of the, of the dead, but it was funny enough. She was actually um, at a major event with the East Schoolenbury Chamber of Commerce, where we are in East Schoolenbury, and I was actually awarded Entrepreneur of the Year, and it was for doing this. 
and she handed me the award and had no idea who I was <laughs> as her former grade 10 student. I mean, I look a little differently. And oh, I looked, and yeah. actually, at, at that time, I had hair. But it was kind of funny to have that weird irony of this situation <laughs> coming about. And so I explained it who, who I was to her. She's like, oh, well, good. <laughs> and that was just a very, I think I shocked her a little bit, but it is kind of nice to see how it comes out because I didn't have access to this when I was a kid either. Yeah. So it's a mixture of, of passion and education and yeah. a passion for presenting and acting and, and passion for history. So, I mean, again, it's, it's a matter of anyone out there who's seeing this right now, you don't have to necessarily go into history. We don't need the competition, but <laughs> anything you want to do, find a way of making it happen because you got to follow your dreams and you only get one life as far as we can prove. So, <laughs> you know, enjoy it to the fullest. Those are the best words you could possibly give anybody who's looking for the chance to try something different. I mean, that's what this interview series is all about. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for your time, guys. I appreciate it. You're very welcome.